A couple things regarding notes. I have this PowerPoint, I put it online, so if there's something random in here that you think is important, you don't need to be scribbling it down. Uh, you're welcome to. Uh, I also have a handout that's kind of um, fairly dense in material, and because of that, I'm gonna withhold it so that you guys focus on me and don't get sucked into the inevitable, like, oh, there's something important I wanna read that's more important than what he's saying. Um, and this will come out at some point in this conversation as well. And it has a lot of this information. Um, this is gonna be less about fertility and more about how the heck we decide what we grow and why we think we can make money doing it. Uh, we'll reserve some time to talk fertility. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm in the, the throes this winter of really liking to make sure that people can come away with something super practical from conversations. And I've talked a lot about fertility over the years, so this was a chance to kind of come back into the space um, and talk about something else. And I'm doing a series of workshops this winter, all crop specific. Uh, if you're local and you're um, interested in going to the NOFA Mass Winter Conference, I'm gonna talk about head lettuce, which is one of our major crops. Uh, and in the spring, uh, down in our neck of the woods, uh, we're gonna talk about the undercard umbellifera, i.e. celery, fennel, and parsley. So I'm trying to kind of give crops that normally don't get a lot of attention, a little more attention. Uh, one of the joys of being a little bit further along in our development is we can spend time getting deep into things like, you know, basil and, you know, figuring out what we can do to make more money. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the farm and then the vision of this was kind of, rather than trying to talk a zillion things, is kind of dial deep into a couple of crops, uh, talk about why we got into those crops uh, what we found is like the, the things that really lever us to the, the world of profit, um, and we'll go from there. We're a small enough group. If the question seems super relevant and germane, jump in during the conversation. If it's not and deemed so, we'll just table it towards the end, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. And then I, um, you know, I'll be around during the break, so if we get into anything really exciting that doesn't get covered. So anyways, three crops which definitely make money. Right, if people have done any analysis of dollar per bed foot, uh, basil probably pencils out uh, really high on that list outside of field house tomatoes or something like that. Um, and uh, so these are the crops we're gonna talk about and uh, I will at some point tell you a little bit about my background but not quite yet. So uh, I'm reading a book called Flavor, just like something I got off of Amazon trying to learn some science, journalistic kind of dive into like the science behind it. And um, you know, a lot of times people think about, there's crops they automatically think about with flavor, but what we're trying to do at Bricks Bounty Farm ultimately is um, provide our community with really high quality vegetables that I can afford to grow economically to support myself and my family and have crew members that get paid halfway decent in the grand scheme of things. Um, and we've been, I've been working with Dan, I'm on the BFA board, I've been working with Dan for a long time. And uh, when he first started going around the conversation around the nutrient meter, we had a gathering in New York. And what came from that gathering was a lot of the small farmers were like, yeah, we're interested in measuring the metrics for ourselves, but the reality is, is once you start growing food and focusing on fertility and, and all those things, you don't really need the metrics because your consumers, all they really care about is, is this. They're like, your yeah, food tastes good, or my, help, helps my body feel good. And you know, I think most people that grow vegetables on any scale will have really nice anecdotes of people coming up to you and telling what their personal story is that says how important what you're doing uh, you know, matters to them. For us, we do a lot of tasting. I'm not a hot pepper person, so I'm doing a lot of tasting of hot peppers, but um, the metric we're constantly using to assess that is, you know, our knife in the field and kind of getting a chance to tune in. So this is the yada yada on the farm. Uh, we have all kinds of catchphrases. Um, one I used for a long time was growing food with respect for the earth and future generations. Uh, I think I, I might have health starts in the soil is one of the ones nowadays. Um, basically it's this idea of Nature can really kind of do some amazing things as long as we kind of put the right ingredients before it to pr provide. And um, I am not, uh, you're gonna see, I'm not uh, no-till, I'm not into some of these like really great biological systems. Um, 
for a variety of reasons, but for us, it's systemically, we found that we haven't been able to like swing that pendulum in that direction. Um, so the approach that we've taken is really to, to provide a full suite and buffet of nutrition from a mineral perspective and then try to let nature figure it out from there. Um, so there's our caveat, which I put this up because of you know, Dan, how much he's been suggesting no-till is the way to go, and I don't want to turn anybody away from no-till. Um, but we, uh, we grow about six acres of veg, and on our scale, uh, we still use a tiller. It's effective and efficient. It gets us from point A to point B really quick. Um, and other things that we do differently than a lot of our neighbors, we don't use irrigation. Um, we're in a coastal location. We're not as extreme as a lot of other parts of the state. And when I first moved to Dartmouth, I worked really heavy soils. So I had the luxury of kind of growing without irrigation, not necessarily on purpose, but because I was like, what's the point? Uh, and then we moved to soils that are not heavy soils, and we kind of kept going with that because um, if anybody's moved to farm, it's pretty busy activity. And sometimes you're just like, oh, we brought all our drip irrigation headers and like stuck them in a hedgerow. And then when the season came, it was like, oh, let's just not worry about doing that work. We got a lot of other things going on. And um, so over the years, uh, we've gone through some really nice droughts, like 10 weeks without significant rainfall kind of droughts, uh, and had a chance to test our systems. And um, I will not claim that you can grow like hip high celery crop in a drought without irrigation, but we can do a lot without irrigation. Uh, but it ultimately comes down to making sure that we have the full suite of minerals available. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of this idea of honoring the complexity of nature and we're gonna provide all those optimum conditions and for us it's minerals, 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 minerals. So we got lots of pictures here. Um, this is that idea. Typically what I like to do is within 24, 48, 72 hours of transplanting, I constantly am digging things up because I'm trying to get a better sense of what's happening, not just above ground, but what's, what's happening below ground. And within that dig, we can find a lot of information. And I've had the luxury of both doing that and then doing that with people that have done it a lot long before me. Uh, we had Hugh Lovell down on the South Coast a number of years ago, and for folks who know him. And we we're talking about boron, uh, which he's talked a lot about as, a, as a something that really helps mobilize calcium. And he's like, well, you should be able to tell your boron levels in your soil. Let's like, go look at the roots and see how pliable those root systems are. So we were digging up garlic, I think it was, because of the time of year that we are on a farm. And we were literally just like kind of trying to see, like, where's that snapping point within that root? And um, so there's a lot of good information if you can tease it out of people how to read your plants and your root systems without just using a soil test and a, you know, a, the, the fun meters that we're going to have in a couple years that we'll just be able to do all this for us. So, you know, typically what we're looking for when we're looking at root systems, we're looking for a good aggregation. Um, we can look at phosphorus levels pretty easily by how naked or sheathed those roots are. If we see really naked tips, um, you're always going to have the very tip of the uh, root is going to have, you know, not much there because it just grew in the last 24 hours. The exudation hasn't taken place. But if you knock the dirt off of there, if you wanted, you know, I don't like to see naked roots. I like to see that good aggregation taking place. That almost always for us is, again, we're not going to talk fertility, but we're slide things in. It's a, it's a boron, it's a phosphorus thing. You've got to mobilize sugars, and you've got to make sure that all the things that are happening above ground are getting put down below ground. So this is one of the ways that we can get by without irrigating is we, you know, put things out there that makes the plant grow. Uh, yeah, we don't use refrigeration. This is more just to give you the background of the farm. So we've got six or seven acres of veg. It's all direct marketed through a roadside stand that's uh, open seven days a week. We have a small summertime CSA, a very small wintertime CSA, uh, and we do one farmer's market. And um, we use wet burlap. This is just at the wash station before things are getting washed. Uh, but we use wet burlap and evaporative cooling to make sure that somebody who buys a head of lettuce at seven o'clock at night gets a really nice product. Um, and it works well for us. It involves a little bit of management. Uh, what we've done over the years is we've just kept adding extra layers of burlap so the farm wash station is just loaded with burlap. So if we're doing head lettuce once it's gone through the wash station, it's four heads of lettuce. We've got a burlap on the bottom, four heads of lettuce, another piece of burlap, four heads of lettuce, another piece of bur burlap. And what that allows us is during the course of the day is we don't have to go re-wet the burlap all the time because the lower layers are kind of nice and moist. I had a question. 
I keep thinking I should look on the um, transportation, you know, like we have planning agencies that will do counts, but we're right south of the high school in town. And uh, we have a town of about 30,000 people that gets a summer influx. And there's sort of three arteries that go through the southern part of town. The reality of our town is that we get very few people from the north side of town because it takes 25 minutes to get from North Dartmouth down to where we are if you hit the traffic in the wrong spot. Um, but yeah, we're not in some rural area. We're in a um, relatively densely populated area. And uh, we, we settled in Dartmouth because there was a farm opportunity. We wanted to be close to family, but we didn't necessarily like, pick this as the spot. And it just sort of worked out over time that we landed on a spot that became a really good marketing location. Um, and so traffic-wise, some people, I once had somebody ask, well, how many cars do you have in your parking lot? That's a good way to suss out like, what your farm stand is. And it's like, our parking lot can probably handle like 10 to 12 cars, and they start, people start parking on the road. It gets a little bit chaotic. Um, and the farm stand that's open seven days a week, we opened it in, sometime in mid-May, just closed it last week. Uh, this year was a great growing season. I think the stand probably did $170,000 in sales. Um, so, and it, it peaks really aggressively in August. So we have uh, weeks in August where we move um, probably fifteen dollars or $16,000 worth of veg just through the, the, the farm stand. So it's not, um, we're relying on a really broad array of customers. We have people that write $50 checks and shop and eat tons of veggies, and we also have people that just come and buy like a tomato and some basil for dinner that night. Um, so if you do all the budgets for most farms, uh, right, it's, it's labor is the big expense on most organic farms. It's harvesting or it's cultivating, it's planting. And um, what we've done over the years is kind of like the irrigation, which I'm sure somebody, is, plenty of people have wanted to debate me on that in the past, is I've really tried to figure out where we can do to reduce our labor. What, what can we do to just be like, that's not a task I need to do. Um, so before we jump into spinach, this is one of my last slides, it's not crop specific. Um, we don't typically wash lettuce mix. I don't think of myself in competition with somebody that's got a clamshell at the grocery store. Primarily because I don't think I can do that better than what the people putting stuff in a clamshell can do and make it at a profitable price. So a couple of weeks ago we had one of the Johnny's reps out and she's talking about this new Terra Trek harvester that um, anybody, they were demoing at Stone Barns this last year. It's a nice, like, powered harvest greens machine. Uh, really looked like pretty beautiful. Much I upgrade on that greens thing that they were using for a long time. It's like eight or 10,000 bucks. And it's like, yeah, if I was growing small little lettuce mix and trying to do all that, some of those types of tools would be useful. What we found is, um, because I'm not competing in a grocery store environment, we grow what we call like our lettuce mix is really like pretty darn large juvenile lettuce. And um, we are cut it, we won't bother washing it, we are just bag it. We wash it under extreme thunderstorm events or something like that. But we are really trying to say that you know, something a customer can do doesn't need to be something that I can do. And it is a luxury, you don't, I don't suggest like starting off that way necessarily, although we sort of did. Um, but over time, I think a bit, little bit about like, well, what are we specialized to do in our capacity? What would I like to focus my energies on? And it's, for the most part, it's trying to grow a really good crop. That doesn't always mean I have to like make it perfect at the end game. So this is a nice example of that. I, I took this picture very specifically this summer because I was like, I'm going to talk about something this winter will be useful. Uh, we had a rainstorm uh, the night before this. And this was on a Sunday morning, I think. I don't know, July 14th. You can go back and look at that. But I feel like it was a Sunday morning. And this was cutting lettuce. And I very specifically was cutting the lettuce from the center of my three-row systems because it was just me on the farm that day. And if I cut from that middle row, I don't have splash up coming up from that rainstorm. And so if I didn't, like the next day when we had Monica or, or somebody back, it's like, oh, we can wash the lettuce after a thunderstorm. But today it's Sunday morning. I got to go quick. I'm just going to cut that center line. So uh, that level of kind of observational engagement is definitely present on a lot of things that we do on the farm because I've gone through it a lot of times and I've been like, all right, Sundays, what do we want to do to do really quick? Um, so at some point, I think it would be fun to like do a, a, a round table for farmers to be like, what are the shortcuts everybody's figured out with all their crops? Um, so yeah, so we're not growing and uh, using a, a bubbler and a salad spinner and all that jazz. We're just kind of 
bagging things and making life easier for us. So we try to treat our CSA members really well, and they appreciate that. We give them a lot of food. There's going to be a, sh a picture in a second. Um, we give them special crops. That's what they're special. They get the dibs on watermelons or sweet corn or stuff that we're not growing in huge quantities. So, all right. So most people, the easiest thing to measure when you're measuring yield is quantity, right? You can put something on a scale. It's pretty easy to see. This is our Hawkeye turnip that we decided to take a picture of at some point here the last couple weeks. Um, but it's not really just about quantity. This is an oversized turnip, right? Um, not necessarily ideal market size. So really what it is for us is we're not just going to quantity, we're going to quality. And what's that look like in reality? Um, one of the big reasons that I put a lot of investment in fertility is the same reason that we cultivate and take care of our crops, is the labor costs of harvest are almost always the highest element of the farm. And so if anybody's had to like pick weeds out of an arugula bed when they're cutting, you know how much that changes your efficiency. And if you're bunching greens and you got to peel off the leaves that suck or something like that, all that stuff kind of takes away from your efficiencies. And because we're not refrigerating and because in July and August we have a huge kind of crunch, we're trying to do almost everything we can to make sure that that harvest moment is really quick, really efficient. Um, so that quality, you know, often improves that harvest experience for us. For the customer, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's about flavor. It would be about nutrition if they eat enough of our vegetables. Um, most of the time, people say things like, oh, everything looks beautiful. You know, you get a head of panisse lettuce, and it's just like anything people want to talk to you about the rest of the summer is how beautiful the lettuce is. Um, and a lot of people talk about the keeping quality. I bought a bag of spinach. It's been in my fridge for two weeks. This gives you a good idea of what kind of customers you have, right? When you see somebody that was talking to one of the women that works at the library, she's like, I bought spinach from you just the other day. And I was like, oh, it's been a couple weeks since we've had spinach in the stand. She's like, it keeps so well. Um, so, uh, yeah, we grow for a CSA, um, but the CSA is not our primary market. Uh, we have about a 60 to 70 share summertime CSA. And partially it's not our primary market because, um, well, ultimately I like giving our CSA the full experience of veggies that you can eat at that time of year. It's a lot of food. And I haven't been willing to necessarily price our CSA at what it needs to be to honor that amount of food. And I haven't necessarily been willing to just be like, oh, you're not going to get spring broccoli anymore because, you know, you don't pay enough. So the bonus for the CSA is they give us a bunch of money up front. means we get cash flow in January, February. And then the way they get that returned is they get an abundance of really good vegetables. <clears throat> um, so over time, I think, Having a really good understanding of the cost of production is a valuable thing. And uh, Richard Wiswall is writing a really nice book on the organic, uh, the business of organic farming. Uh, he likes to talk this, this profit equals income minus expense. Um, I've worked a lot over the years. I've done very detailed crop by crop enterprises. You know, it can get really overwhelming. Uh, where we often recommend people to start is just pick one or two crops that you want to monitor over the course of the season or figure one question that you want to answer. Don't try to like come up with what it costs for me to produce 40 different crops. And so I do that. We do that every year still. We pick some crops that we're like, I need to know a little bit more detail. Like this year, I'm actually going to track how much summer squash we pick out of every single summer squash bed. But we don't measure and monitor most everything. Like we put down what's on the harvest list. Um, but the nice thing about our farm stand being so loosey-goosey is like, you know, if we're harvesting 24 bunches of parsley, I don't tell the crew this, but if it's my weekend and I just put rubber bands on my fingers and if I'm in between 20 and 27 when I'm done, I'm like, all right, the parsley's done harvesting. I don't necessarily have to always be in this like, this is how many bunches I do because I'm not wholesaling. There's not really waste within over harvesting on our farm because it just carries forward to the next day. Um, but we are constantly looking at like, what's the cost of production? How much time does it take to plant? How much time does it take to cultivate? What's our input costs? What are the fixed costs of the farm as a whole? We bought a fancy new tractor this year, so theoretically all the crops have to pay for that fancy new tractor for the next four or five years. Um, so demand, right? I mean, I'm curious. Does anybody have tomatoes not on their top five most important crops? There might be some people in the room. Is there anybody? 
you're growing more specialized garlic and other things I know, but I mean, we have a neighbor of ours that, that used to grow on the South Shore and was used to making a ton of money on tomatoes and they moved to Westport and Little Compton and they're like, oh, there's a lot of people that have home gardens and all of a sudden, like, we're not in that situation where we can make a lot of money on tomatoes. Yeah, so I mean, we're in that, like, I, I think of myself as blessed in the sense that there's a bunch of crops that our customers want that happen to be crops that are theoretically profitable to grow. Cherry tomatoes are one of those ones that's like, are they profitable? So over the years, I, I really got a good sense of like, what's my labor cost for picking, right? And as you start to look at that and you say, well, this is marginally profitable, you have some things like, what can we do to make it more profitable? One of the easiest ways is just to raise the price. And so we're at now, we sell these half pints of cherry tomatoes, which um, are about three quarters of an actual pint. If you do a dry pint and a dry half pint, you heap them both and you put them on a scale, this will measure out to about uh, somewhere around 11 or 12 ounces. And we sell them for 350 a half pint. At some point, we raise the price. Um, and we never have anybody balking at the price because the quality's there and we're giving them something they can't get other places. Um, so, you know, we evaluate and I'll share with you in a little bit our list of all these crops and um, we've looked at all these metrics. What's the low and the high value per bed foot? What's the cost of production before harvest? So green beans are really labor intensive to harvest, but they're pretty easy to grow before harvest. So you can kind of figure out some of those things and, and a lot of it comes down to gut feeling and customer demand, but it's really easy to nice inform that gut with a little bit more information to be like, well, I know if I'm going to do green beans. Uh, we didn't grow a lot of green beans this summer, but like the last time we grew green beans a lot, 2018, we grew a ton of green beans. We put our green beans, yeah, we bag them. They're um, 10 ounce bags, give or take, and they're four bucks a bag. And where I came to that price was I was like at some point figuring out like what's enough money I can make off of picking and bagging a, ba a basket of green beans on a Saturday when I want to go to the beach with my family. Like what's enough money to make me actually say that I'm going to like take the time to, to take the final step from that crop to the field to the customer. Um, and then also trying to start to understand like why the demand exists. The joy of a lot of small farms is we get to introduce new flavors, new crops, new things, and we can create demand. Uh, when we moved to Dartmouth, and we still get this question all the time, people ask us about husk cherries, like inevitably from about mid-August through early October at the farmer's market, at the farm stand, all these other places. I rarely grow husk cherries, but when we moved to Dartmouth, there happened to be a guy who was growing like a half an acre of husk cherries every year. And so like, it kind of created this, like that demand would not have existed if he hadn't been going to the farmer's market for five and 10 years constantly, like not just having like a couple of baskets of husk cherries, but having like an entire table of husk cherries. Um, so understanding a little bit why there's demand for certain crops and also having that awareness that we can influence that demand. Um, outside of tomatoes, probably one of our highest demand crops are cucumbers. Um, one of the farmers I worked with used to say that the least amount of work required to eat that crop, those are your highest demand crops. Your cherry tomatoes, they just go into the mouth as the mom is driving away from the farm stand. Strawberries, sugar snap peas, you know, all those kinds of things. And as you get into something that requires like peeling, extended cooking time, you know, all those kinds of things, the demand tends to, because you get all these people that don't do anything in the kitchen. Cucumbers, um, they are in a sweet spot, right? And people can just eat them just like that. A lot of times they slice them. Uh, they don't really have, one of our crew members, Danny was talking about how there's not really a, a, a good substitute for cucumbers and what they do in a culinary uh, way. So um, maybe about seven or eight years ago, I listened to one of our neighbors that's much bigger than us that was talking about how they're making like 10 grand off of one cucumber house in their spring market. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, I should be planting more than just tomatoes in my tunnel. I got to start like investigating. There's some, something to be said. And so now we have two tunnels and uh, this year we grew, we have 16 beds in those two tunnels, um, 30 by 96 tunnels. And this year we grew six of those beds as cucumbers. And what we found, especially as downy mildew is kind of an issue that kind of shunts production down late season, is it's really nice. This year we had an early crop, May 26th, pickling excelsior cucumbers. Uh, it's a small pickling variety. Uh, last year I went to a high tunnels conference up in New Hampshire and I met a guy that had like four tunnels of cucumbers up in Maine. It's like only grew one variety of cucumber. I'd never grown Excelsior. 
for a variety of reasons, but I was like, well, if that man is growing four tunnels of the same variety, we're gonna try it. And it's ended up being a really nice productive cucumber. Yeah, we've played around with all kinds of things over the years, and the tunnels, not so much. Um, we grow English cucumbers, we grow uh, mini snacking cucumbers, just in small quantity, because my son is a cucumber aficionado, and he really loves them, so I'm like, all right, you know, the joy of having a dad who farms is like you can grow the exact cucumber your kid wants. Um, English cucumbers, and then like Corintos, Paraisos, any of those really nice slicers. Those nice slicers, when they're trellised in a, I mean, it's not unusual to have like a 15-inch slicing cucumber, not even just the English cucumbers. Um, so you can, people, and then they taste amazing because they're like actually real cucumbers, and you're doing all kinds of fun things with them. So this is our core 15, and I'll pass this list out. Um, this is through the decade or so we run a CSA in the market. These are the 15 crops we identify that if we do these crops well, our customers are happy. And farm-wise, the farm's gonna sustain from year into year out. We don't hit all 15 of those every year. Normally, one or two of those underperforms. This year, we, we had a horrible potato season for a lot of reasons. But these are our 15 most critical crops um, to grow. And then the three bonus ones, which are our season extension crops. So if we do well with these, then everything else um, is gonna kind of be the complement. And that's where basil and spinach and shallots fit in. Um, all right, so let's get into crops. Um, so we're going to talk about basil. Uh, just very briefly, we'll come back to basil, but we're going to dive into spinach primarily. But here's going back to those metrics, right? Um, this is devotion basil. So uh, Johnny's and a bunch of other companies have released a bunch of downy mildew resistant basil varieties last year. Um, they used to grow Eleonora, if anybody tried that for a while. There's a couple other things. Uh, but this last year, they brought out Prospera, which was uh, from one of the Middle Eastern countries, and then Rutgers Devotion, Rutgers Obsession. And um, so our demand, going back to those cherry tomatoes, other things, we have a lot of people who are just like seasonal residents that want to eat, you know, Capri salads in, in August. So we would have Downy Mildew come in. We're in a coastal wet location. And I had never been able to, with all our fertility programming, create some magical Downy Mildew resistant basil crop. Um, and so I used to say, like, man, if somebody does this, I mean, they're going to basically give us thousands of dollars because the amount of basil that we can harvest from early August through October is a significant amount. Um, so here is the basil. This is a smaller of those three varieties. I'll talk about the varieties when I get into the basil section. This was a day in August, uh, August 13th this year. It took me to five bed feet to fill a nice orange bushel basket, and I've got 24 bags out of that. Those small bags are probably two or three ounce basil bags. $16 per bed foot off of a single cut of basil, right? It pencils out in a pretty dramatic way if you have the demand for people that want to buy that much basil. And we have enough people at that peak part of the year, that's kind of going back to the luck of our real estate, um, that you know, I can sell sometimes 30 or 40 bags of basil on a Saturday or Sunday. So we, we vary it based on where we're at in the marketing season for that basil and what the crop is. I don't like, we don't get, I don't have the crew weigh things out. Um, so like devotion's a little smaller leaf than Prospera, so we might give a little bit less, but generally it's probably a two to three ounce bag. Um, and then we also sell larger pesto bags for about three weeks out of the year, which is probably like eight ounces of basil. It's a couple of cups, like, and we sell that for five or six bucks based on where we think the quality is so on and so forth. When we come back to basil, we'll talk about the, the beauty of basil keeping in an in a unrefrigerated farm stand. Um, just for comparison, that morning I, I ran some numbers because I knew I was going to talk about basil at some point this winter. Uh, I cut some loose leaf kale, starboard kale, single cut. We got about $9 per bed foot. And then our head lettuce, which you see pictures of, cutting three heads per bed foot. Um, if we're pack out rate is as high as it was out of that field, which is like 97 or 8 percent, all those heads came out beautiful. You're looking at $12 per bed foot. So, you know, basil is, is it's a nice way to make money. Um, every time we evaluate the crop, we're thinking about it within that whole scenario of the farm, right? We can't just become a basil farm. We need to offer a nice wide selection. And that's been our niche that we've developed is we try to give like that full diversity within the CSA, but also provide our customers at the farm stand a nice offering. So we grow cilantro um, pretty much consistently from the end of May into the fall. And that means we do a ton of succession plantings of cilantro. And so that the home gardeners that plant cilantro once and then have all their cilantro bolt, they can come get cilantro even though they have tomatoes. Um, 
We're in a, a coastal location, which means we get not too harsh of a start to the fall. It all tends to be really kind of cool in the springtime. Um, I've had experiences where I drive 15 or 20 minutes or 20 to 25 minutes to my neighboring farm, and it'll be 15 degrees warmer there than it is on my place in the springtime just because of the fact that we have a big giant ocean of cold water that tends to refrigerate us. Um, so what that inevitably means for us is we decided that it's worth in, like actually wasting our time, spending a heap of time doing row cover. I used to say like, oh, the way we're going to judge our success or a farm is we don't need to use row cover for bugs. We only need to use it to extend the temperature window. So this spring we decided to go like all in on row cover, which is it was just sort of like, I guess, the feeling like I was like, hey, we're going to just do stuff. We're going to start row covering our onions. We haven't row covered onions in the last like five or six seasons, but let's row cover onions. Let's put less onions in the ground, row cover them, take a little bit more care of them. We had a cool spring. It ended up being great because we ended up row covering like so many crops that you're going to see that by early June we were harvesting a really nice wide selection. So when the farmer's market in town, it's not necessarily a great farmer's market, we don't go to it, um, starts their market and the crop, the, the growers are coming with like five or six crops, people are kind of walking away being like, ah, oh, you know, well, I got strawberries, but I didn't get like a really nice diversity. And it's like, oh, we don't do any marketing for the farm stand. It's all word of mouth, but, you know, people talk. They're like, oh, yeah, I got spinach and I got cucumbers, you know, all these crops from, from Bricks Bounty. So anyways, uh, we use a lot of row cover. So in the springtime, we have, so the springtime typically is the, the windiest time on the, you know, before the leaves have filled out. And we're in a coastal location, so it's not unusual to get a bunch of 45 mile per hour windstorms. Uh, generally, I call it four paces, about 10 feet between hoops. And I think I was talking with you or something, but the very beginning of the beds, we always double that density so we get uh, you know, more weight on there. Um, and yeah, it's, it, the, we just had one of our crew members been with us for three years. He's leaving. We're doing the talking about row cover. And he's like, yeah, I still feel like I haven't got row cover down. Like, it is, um, for me, it's the easiest way to learn patience with the crew because uh, it takes them. There was one day you guys were real covering melons this year. I know there was something where I was like, I thought you guys had gone home. <laughs> and I came back into the field and I was like, oh, I think I like, had gone home to eat dinner. And I came back and I'm like, oh shit, you guys are still here. It's like, I thought you guys were going to be gone like an hour ago. And, and they were like really good spirits. I think you're like, oh yeah, we're just talking. I think they got through that breaking point. I was like, I like to have them have that experience every so often. But I can really efficiently, like, if I'm going and doing a 200 foot long better row cover, it's about a 15 minute start to finish hoops, row cover, all that jazz by myself. Because um, I've done it so many times. But the crew takes a lot longer. But the nice thing is by the time summer rolls around, we don't have to work with row cover at all. And then the second year people come back, they get even better. Um, so what that looks like in reality, I mean, this is celery, right? Not on our core 15 list. This is not a like, key crop. But if you grow it and you offer real celery to people, they like it. And so we used to grow celery. We still grow celery. We used to say, oh, let's grow celery. We'll start cutting it in August. And over the years, I'm like, we'd start having like a little bit nicer celery. We'd start cutting it like mid-July. And over time, you realize that like, people just want the flavor. They don't really need this giant stalk of celery. So like, here's our celery that we, I assume we hadn't been cutting it for that long. I can't imagine we had it that much earlier than uh, June 23rd. And so what we've done there is um, taken a crop that's not a marquee crop, taken our traditional harvest window and just broadened it for the people that like that crop. And what it does, a lot of times, I don't go to a competitive farmer's market in June or anything, so I'm not trying to set myself. But I do get people back into the rhythms, right? They haven't been eating celery from our farm since last fall. And now they get a chance to taste it and they get, oh, yeah, I like that celery. i got to get some more of that celery. Um, fennel, all those kind of random things. And that, uh, I'm f quite confident in our coastal location, this doesn't have the celery under row cover in this picture. Um, that celery wasn't planted yet. But um, you don't get to that without good fertility programs. And for us, that row cover modulation is, is very significant. Thanks so much. All right, we're going to talk about spinach. Uh, a few years ago, there was all this rage about making yourself a germ fridge. I had this old stand-up freezer that was in my garage, the house that we bought. Um, we just went online and followed all those instructions. There's a crock pot and a temperature. It costs us about 40 bucks to put together. Um, we don't heat our greenhouse. We're a little bit, we're in a coastal location where we can get by without heating our greenhouse. We use a little supplemental bottom heat for our nightshades in the springtime. 
Um, but when I first moved to Dartmouth, we worked those wet fields. There was never a rush to get into the fields because I could never, some years I wouldn't get into the fields till mid-May. So I was like, what's the point of having a heated greenhouse if I don't need starts April 4th? Um, so over the years, we haven't heated our greenhouse. Um, we do some you know, row covers and, and things in the tunnel, in the house to make sure our tomatoes are ready to transplant in, in April for the greenhouse. One of the reasons we don't do that is because it naturally modulates where the transplants are supposed to be based on the growing season, right? You know, if, if you have a heated greenhouse and you're giving all these plants all these love, and then you have the last three springs in Massachusetts have been cold, and so you end up having these like full-size transplants ready to go on, on April 1st, and you're like, oh, hold up. Um, but what we have found is, you know, the slowest part of an unheated greenhouse is that germination, and, and we have limited space with our heat mats. This germ chamber has, has been a really nice thing. And, I picked up another fridge on the side of the road this summer, so we get to have two of these things going next year. Um, so we use this for anybody who's growing winter greens. Uh, we're often cycle a new crop of winter greens in the ground in February, like mid-February. It just sort of depends on the rhythm. And we can use this fridge like the third week of January to get spinach or brassicas or lettuce just to pop. It's all we need to get them to pop, so they've kind of gone through that cycle. And then we can put them underneath row cover in an unheated greenhouse. You get enough sunny days, they're going to grow and grow and, you know, maybe you have a transplant ready in three weeks, maybe it's four weeks. Maybe you have a spot where if you really need it, you know, if you ended up going 15 below, you could throw a heater on or something for the night. Um, so spinach is kind of like, um, uh, I don't know, who grows spinach in the room? Hopefully some people because we're going to talk about it. Where would you rate it on demand curve? High, right? I mean, it is... Uh, It'd probably be in the top five on our farm. You could grow it, you can grow it, you can grow it, and people love it. Again, we're not going to grow spinach that's going to compete with the baby leaf market on our farm. So I'm not growing baby leaf spinach. I'm not drilling 13 lines into a bed, and I'm not you know, making you know, something that people can use it for salad if they want, but I'm growing like a full-size spinach. Um, we grow it here. This is for the winter CSA. We have a small winter CSA, so they get to luxuriate in tons of beautiful spinach. Um, and then mostly it's for the farm stand. Uh, this is just the agronomic stuff, right? We're growing to 128s, two seeds per cell. We're using Fort V as our potting mix. We generally transplant three to four weeks after seeding. Um, spinach is a really nice, I was talking about root systems, really nice indicator of calcium availability in your root transplants. Uh, if you've really ever grown really nice spinach transplants, what we do every so often, you have these pearly white, just glistening root systems. You don't have any of that kind of browning, deading uh, taking place. Um, oftentimes, uh, calcium plays a role in that, which we'll talk about in a sec. Uh, we put them down in three rows, six inch spacing. Uh, so for us, each flat covers 20 bed feet. We're doing often 80 feet or 120 feet at a whack, so it's four or six flats a week. Uh, we use row cover, we use sticky traps to control leaf miners. See a picture of that in a second. Typically, because uh, we are tilling, we do have to cultivate uh, for a crop of spinach. It's normally twice one of those crops is a hand weeding session, which is just built around making sure the harvest efficiency is there. And our yields totally vary based on what size spinach we're growing, um, but generally it's about a basket for every six or eight feet. And we get 10 to 12 bags. They're about eight ounces each bag. We charge four bucks for a bag of spinach. We don't wash spinach. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm not certified organic. I followed organic practices to a T up until about three years ago, and then I decided I wasn't going to certify, and I wanted to play around with some of the Reams approach with calcium nitrate. So we use a couple of conventional fertilizers, which I talk about. And uh, I'm not GAP certified. There's a um, CQP in Massachusetts doing some stuff with food safety, and I had them come out to not do an official audit, but to walk through. And because I'm like, I kind of lament, I was talking about this some point in the last few days, like I don't want to be in a future where I have to always wear like plastic gloves when I harvest greens. But you know, that might be our future from a food safety perspective. Um, washing, if you listen to what Vern Grubinger at UVM's done in research, is you know, you're co-mingling in stage one. So if you have really dirty wash water, if you do a single wash, you're probably going to make things worse. And so as far as I'm concerned, washing's not really great from a food safety perspective. From a keeping quality, we can time our harvest within the rhythms of the day based on dewfall and other situ situations where we can kind of get different moisture levels. So if we want to have better keeping quality, so it's nice about that winter spinach um, is we can give the CSA a ton of winter spinach out of the tunnel and you can put it in the fridge and it's going to be there forever. Um, I mean, they'll eat it before that, but it'll keep forever. 
Yep, yep. So it's six inches. I uh, know in between the rows, it's three row systems on about a six foot wide bed, and so it's three rows. And you'll see some overhead pictures that'll give you that visual really well. Um, and I got all my successions laid out in a second, so you'll see those. This was from our first and second planting this year. This is a picture taken on May 8th. So those beds were transplanted. The spinach was transplanted on April 12th. And the row cover was put on within two or three days. Um, and then it was cultivated twice and harvested. And I wrote all these things down so we could talk about them. Um, but this would be that deep dive. You know, you pick a crop one year and be like, all right, let's just grow a ton of spinach and let's track all the random things so I can see the metrics. Spinach is really nice because they come out with new variety. You find a new variety you like and then they drop it and three years later you've got to find another new variety. So you constantly get to trial new varieties. And so running side by sides, we've been doing, I always do a romaine test on our farm every year. Um, three or four varieties of romaine right at the like back end of when I can, or the front end of when I can get romaine into the height of the summer. Normally it's like we have high demand for romaine lettuce at our farmer's market. Some of the um, ethnic communities love romaine lettuce, kind of like iceberg, right? They don't really care about leaf lettuce. So I'm always like, well, what romaine can I grow in middle of July? So every year I'm like, let's plant a couple new romaine varieties and see how they do against our cornerstone romaine varieties. We do the same thing with spinach every year. We're constantly evaluating um, spinach. And um, this might be one way to do that is maybe you decide that you're going to do a fertility side by side. And is nitrogen my limiting factor? That might be the question. And I'm going to take the same planting of spinach, do all my bread prep differently, and split that bed in half or split it in three and do different nitrogen applications. Look at the cost of what that application was and look at your yields and measure your yields. Um, I'll get the question in one second. I did this very, um, when I first started doing winter growing, I did that really meticulously for all our lettuces because I wanted to know like, you know, some of those red leaf lettuces that you're harvesting in January don't yield what the green leaf were and that bed foot was so valuable in a greenhouse, I wanted to know exactly, oh, maybe I only put a little bit of that red leaf in because it doesn't really pull its weight. Where was the question? Yes and no, we have. I think next year we're going back away from doing it. We're using Vermont compost. We've spiked it. This year we're playing around with putting special silica in and a few other things. The Vermont compost is a really nice mix. You don't really need to amend it more than you do. Uh, I think where we're going to go back to next year is we've, uh, we just use a hose-on injector to inject good things into the, the liquid when we're watering. And uh, that's going back to that calcium. If you can get like a good quality calcium that you water with, um, that can really help root growth in those starts. Oh. Theoretically, once a week. Um, in reality, maybe once every, th sometimes it's once a week, sometimes it's once every three weeks. It all depends on what our foliar energy is. We do foliars sometimes starting in March, and we stop doing them probably in June when life gets busy with cucurbit season. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you could do a test with foliar quality. Right? You could be like, we're going to grow spinach, we're going to do nothing else, but I'm going to just spray. I mean, this is a good idea. If you think foliars are valuable, like, spray foliars and find out if they make a difference. Um, we did that. I don't know if you tasted that fennel one, one year. A couple, we did that a, a couple years ago, where, and one of our crew members was kind of skeptical about foliars. said, all right, let's, let's spray, but only spray this half of the fennel bed. Don't spray that half of the fennel bed. Foliars on our farm, what we think they do is they take something that's really, like, theoretically pretty good and take it to that next level. And oftentimes they boost that sugar just that next level so that like you eat a fennel stem and you're just like, wow, the sugar content in here is really good. You know, you eat the broccoli stem. I make a big sign when I sell broccoli in the springtime that says, don't waste your stems. It's like part of the best experience of Bricks Bounty broccoli is these stems that are like just loaded with sugar. Loaded with sugar because that stem is that highway for moving things around. Uh, boy, with spinach, with anything that you're putting row cover on in the springtime, like do an early season phosphorus test. If you're organic, do bone char at 200, 400, 600, 800 pounds per acre application rate versus nothing. And look at what you see, not just in yield, but dig a plant up. Look, look and see, see that exudation factor. Uh, you could look and see, like, is there gloss? I mean, spinach is really nice because it tells you what's going on. When you have really nice spinach, I mean, it is like shiny. Beautiful, that reflect variety from Johnny's, like it literally looks like it just glossed. We always, I mean, John Kemp always talks about that lipid layer. 
Um, I mean, you can see that when crops grow well, and the, the, the beets and the char and the spinach are often really good at showing that. Sometimes the celery or the cilantro, we call it shellac, if it looks like it's got like a really good sheen on it. So you, well, you're working something in the right direction. Uh, we do variety side-by-sides with spinach, looking at yield, bolt resistance, all those kinds of things. You can do management side-by-side. -side. We sometimes do this. We leave a little bit of spot that's not covered with row cover, and then the crew understands how much row cover speeds the growth along, and they're more willing to wrestle row cover in the springtime because they're like, oh, yeah, we're harvesting spinach here, and that row cover's you know, not there. We did that with tomatoes, I think, this year for a little bit early on. Um, so this was how our successions looked in the springtime. We're planting basically... Um, transplanting every week or two weeks, one, every week once we get into the height of the season. Uh, we grew 10 successions, the, late, the last two. Um, that first one's labeled P. So when I moved to Dartmouth, I was like, wow, this, this is a little bit milder, but it's also colder spring. So I, just to complicate things, I started with my pre-successions, which are we do in all our greenhouse planting cycles. We have a P succession, and that crop is we plant in the greenhouse, and if, if the field conditions are suitable, we transplant it. And if not, we just compost it. And I don't have to feel bad about composting it because I don't know on February 19th whether it's going to be good spinach transplanting weather on March 30th. But if I have a couple of flats ready and it is good spinach transplanting weather, I can put them in the ground. So we always do these pea successions. And then this year, I was going to do late successions of spinach 9 and 10, seeded 521, 528. Then when push came to shove mid-June, I was like, there's no, why, why bother transplanting that spinach? It's going to be a waste of our time. So we sometimes will try that same version of kind of extending the season on the back end. For us, what we found is consistently, basically, the spinach that's in by Memorial Day is really good marketable spinach. And any spinach that's transplanted after Memorial Day is not necessarily good marketable spinach. In the springtime, yes, from a um, speed of, of growth and also really kind of like getting the crop just to absolutely go. In the fall, we used to do both. We'd kind of run side-by-side -side successions. We haven't direct seeded spinach the last two or three years, and that's been more of a factor of us just not having like prepped beds quickly enough in the fall. We're oftentimes just be like, oh, we got to get some beds prepped, and then like the turnaround time between crop residue and planting can be like pretty minimal, like a week or something like that. Um, there's a lot of thought to like, is it? You know, quality-wise, transplants versus direct seed, you know, putting something in the ground that doesn't have to go through that transplant cycle. If you have really cr crummy soils, transplants will give you better production because you start them in a nice, like if you're using a nice potting mix, you got yourself off to a good start. Um, for us, uh, I'm not using mechanical transplanters. I'm hand transplanting, and we've really tried to go towards younger transplant cycles, try to put a spinach. It's not root-bound, you know, all those other kind of things. And bolting is not an issue if you're putting plants in the ground that are at the right stage and the plants are healthy. Um, it just, ultimately, it's just a decision of how you want to manage your time. Do you like transplanting or do you like thinning and cultivating? Or if you're doing no-till, you can do all the magic stuff that Brian O'Hara does, then you, everything is golden. Yeah, I mean, I think learning to manage your, your cells, and it's also just kind of like learning how to pull plugs out. Like it, Oftentimes, like when we have the crew transplant, like often I'm still the person pulling plugs out at the early stages of the game. If you're growing, uh, if you ever grow hawker eye turnips from transplant, that'll probably be like pretty high in your list of things that could frustrate the crew. Uh, beets, beets can be up there, and spinach is somewhere there, but it's also oftentimes a pretty good indication. Like if you grow a nice, healthy transplant, you can still pull out spinach transplants pretty quick. Um, so. I don't use a popper. Uh, you know, maybe the guy from Two Bad Cats has one that would be suitable to play around with. We should probably revisit it. Um, the crew, theoretically, I will talk to them about how long it should take. Uh, 128 for me, if I'm pulling plugs in the field, it takes about three minutes or four minutes at most to do a flat. So it's, it takes, I, you know, if I'm going to do a 20-foot section of field, uh, I would expect myself to do that in about eight minutes. So if I'm doing four flats of spinach, Eight times four it should take me about half hour to transplant four flats of spinach. Um, I won't have those expectations on somebody who just shows up on the farm without background, but we'll kind of slowly start to say expectations um, so we get an idea of there. And we will, um, like Monica, you did a lot of plug pulling for us. Maybe it's because Danny's back, but it's also because like, we, we kind of specialize. We find somebody who's good at a certain task, and we're like, all right, they're going like, to have that locked in, and we know it's going to be done well. And pulling plugs is harder to do well than actually putting the plant in the ground. 
Uh, yeah, it's been a long time. Uh, somebody, we're talking about that with the um, Vermont compost folks. At the time, I used to say, I can't afford to do soil blocks until I, unless I sell lettuce at $4 a head. Nowadays, I'd probably be like, I can't afford to do soil blocks unless I sell lettuce at $6 a head. Um, it's just, it's a labor intensive process. And if you're growing quick cycle crops like cilantro or those kind of things, it's just really hard to make the economics work. On a tomato or a pepper or something that's gonna be in the ground for a long time, or winter squash, yeah, maybe the economics can pencil out, but I've never been able to do it. Um, and it's an art form. Like, I did it for two whole years on the vineyard way back when, so I got, a, you know, got into it. But it's, it's nowhere near as fast as what it takes somebody to fill flats. So, um, and one final thing about transplants. Uh, we had the joy, we had the guy, one of the guys from Spiral Path come up to do uh, this conference about four years ago. And he was throwing cucumber transplants from 128s in the ground. And um, if I did some research when I was doing the deep dive into celery. Michigan's a huge celery world. I don't know if ever guys see these big celery farms. I think they all grow celery plugs in 288s and go from that into the field. What my experience of small farms are is the greenhouse is this beautiful time of year where it's slow and it's like so like joyous to be like lavishing so much love on each little cell and transplant. And um, the reality is I've seen some farms that put some pretty gnarly plants in the ground and still get good crops out of the ground. And John often talks, Kemp talks a lot about you know, what you're doing to take away pr potential yield. And you can grow some really nice transplants, but if your soils aren't ready to receive that transplant and go with it, it can make a huge difference. So over the years, I, I think we've gone to like, sometimes we take excellent care of our transplants, and sometimes we have a year where it's just like, oh, our transplants are gonna be serviceable, but they're not gonna be like winning some award-winning contest for transplant production. And for the most part, uh, even the not so serviceable transplants will come through. I mean, I had an experience, this is going back a long time ago. I farmed on the vineyard, uh, first started farming in the Boston area and then farmed on Martha's Vineyard for a couple seasons. So this was like in 2004, uh, where we put a bunch of broccoli plants out and all of a sudden cabbage moths showed up and just like defoliated entire flats. And it was like right before planting. So these starts were like four weeks, five weeks in and I was like, we were using soil blocks. So I was like, I'm not gonna reseed more broccoli. I'm like, I wonder what happens when you put a broccoli plant that literally has no foliage. I was like, I can still put it in the field and, and row cover it. And we got broccoli off that crop. I mean, not ideal. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, let's talk about the field aspect of things. So this is, uh, we got nice side by side of two varieties. So one of the ways that we extend our harvest window because one of the things that sucks about spinach is it has a very narrow harvest window and a very narrow marketing window. We're talking about shallots in a little bit. You know, shallots you can harvest and sell them for six months. That spinach you bag, and if you're not using refrigeration, it really should be sold in about 48 hours. Um, so one of the ways that we've kind of built insurance into the farm is so if we're doing our 120-foot beds, a lot of times on the shoulder windows where we're going into the summer season is like we try to pick some two different varieties so we can not have the whole 120 foot bed come through on the same day. So, so this was that example of this last year, thanks Monica, um, of reflect side by side with seaside. And this is the first year we grew seaside. Uh, it's known for being slow growing, which historically put me off to it. I was like, I don't really want a slow growing spinach. But then eventually you read enough and they talk about it being really good heat resistant spinach. So I was like, maybe I gotta find out about it. So I mean, you can see that. These are pictures taken, starts the same exact day in the greenhouse, transplanted the same exact day, and look at that canopy difference. Dramatic difference. But the nice thing about this is, by doing this, that seaside is ready four, seven days later, because eventually that seaside fills in that bed. And by that point, we've harvested all the reflect. But if we tried to take 120 foot banting of reflect and space it out over, you know, seven or 10 days of harvest, you get a sweet spot, but you'd end up maybe having some crummy stuff at the end of the cycle. So um, we've been really happy. Seaside trialed for the first time in 2019, and, and I had one of those moments where like, why haven't I been growing seaside more? Uh, Fedco sells a variety called Oceanside. We did trial side by side with those. There's some like slight variations. Um, but there's something to be said for really slow growing spinach from a bolt resistance standpoint. I might, um, going back to like the bags, 
you know, I might alter the bag weight if I'm doing something in the field that's not yielding quite as much. We grow Corvair as probably one of our main spring varieties. We really like Corvair. Uh, Space is a productive variety, but grows really flat. So um, if you don't have a crew that's effective and fast at harvesting, flat spinach slows them down. So having a nice upright, that's one of the nice things about sea size, really nice and upright. Um, Flavor-wise, I think these all passed the test. I don't know how much you were, you weren't harvesting as much spinach in the spring, so I don't know how much you tasted things, but um, yeah, they all passed the test. Cutting, cutting just single cut. Uh, in the springtime, in the tunnels we get multiple cuts, and again, I'm just, I don't have the patience to do single leaf harvest. I don't just like to do, I know Paul and Sandy Arnold have run all the numbers. It makes a lot more sense to do it economically in the winter production. We just clear cut and let it regrow in the tunnels. In the summer, we just clear cut and move on to the next planting. To fill an orange basket of spinach should take you a couple minutes. You know, it's a really quick, it's going back to like, this is June 19th, so our to-do list on June 19th is like this entire harvest list, and that's not even the important stuff of the day. The important stuff of the day is like, we got all this cultivation to do so the weeds don't take over the farm, and we got all this transplanting to do, and we got all this bed prep to do, the to-do list at that time of the year. So one of the things we've been really um, keyed into is we really, avoid too much labor-intensive crops early in the harvest season, right? We don't grow a lot of arugula in June. We do grow some for the CSA, but I'm not trying to have arugula there from start to finish because inevitably it's like if you have weeds in it or the quality's not there, it slows you down. And if I am spending too much time giving a nice crop out on June 19th, it means I can't be taking care of the crop. That's why celery and fennel are nice additions to your June market, because they're like fast as can be. You just zip, zip, zip in the field. Um, what's that look like? So um, I was thinking about this last night. I can remember a year that we moved on to our new farm, and I was telling one of our crew members, uh, one of our work shares, I was like, oh, we're going to have so much spinach this year. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have like more spinach than you could ever know, because I decided it was the year where I like, had the aha, like everybody loves spinach, so we're going to plant like 5,000 bed feet of spinach. And that was the first year like leaf miner came up on our farm in a serious way. And all of a sudden we had like beautiful spinach and then we had really shitty spinach. And it went down and I was just like, oh, that was kind of humbling, the joy of farms. I always say that the, the, the pest and disease would be the biggest problem in like three or four years. I don't even know what it is, right? It's something else that's lurking behind the shadows. Leaf miner became a huge issue for us the last few, not few years, but maybe six or seven years ago. And over time, one of uh, our former crew members who runs a farm nearby, he was using these blue sticky traps to, to do some things. And what we found out is like if you're using row cover, you don't need to spray a pesticide to take care of things. I, don't, I should say that. We don't spray any pesticides in our farm. We, don't, we follow organic practices. I use some conventional fertility, so we're not technically organic. But I don't use Pyganic. I'm not using Spinosad and Trust, uh, you know, Neem or any of those kind of things. If I have pests, I usually use that as an indication that we're not going in the right direction. So, uh, but boy, we never really got anywhere. You're like, oh, I know uh, there were a few people uh, here that have talked about getting things dialed in so that the leaf miner wouldn't be a problem. We just still had leaf miner, and our solution has been these blue sticky cards. They're pretty cheap. You can put them underneath the row cover, put them at the end of the beds underneath the row cover, and the flies do that and they get cycled out of the rotation. We haven't conquered flea beetles, and we had the worst flea beetle season we've ever had this, this year. Monica suggested we buy a vacuum cleaner, so I went and bought a vacuum cleaner. Um, <laughs> I, I'm being dead serious. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I did research onto, onto that like five years ago. It didn't seem practical, and then I was like, but she, I think you were like, have you thought of vacuuming? And I was like, so then I went to Home Depot, and now they have all these like, vacuum cleaners that you can use your cordless drill into us. So I was like, we're going to find out. Um, so I literally was vacuum cleaning flea beetles off cabbage to find out, like, economically, could you afford to vacuum flea beetles. Uh, next year, we might. We use row cover um, and try to time our row cover. And, um, but there's something going on, and I haven't been able to figure it out, but is it the quality of the transplant not where it needs to be? Is it the maturity of a, of a, a soil in the spring that's cool? There was a number of years ago where we had tunnel crops and that had brassicas in the tunnel, and we had brassicas literally 10 feet outside of that tunnel. And the only major difference between those two crops was the tunnel crops had about a couple weeks head start, and they were in a different physiological place when flea beetle season started, which is normally for us like the first 70 degree day in April or May. 
And we had almost no predation in the tunnel, and we had a lot of predation on the choy and other things outside. And the stuff in the tunnel was like arugula. It was stuff that was attractive. And so I think something that happens with us in the spring is that um, maybe like we don't have the right digestive energies in the root systems in a cold spring soil to build plant immunity to flea beetles. Because uh, we have not, like we've done a lot of work with fertility and there's certain pests that we see a lot less of through our practices, like cabbage moths historically haven't been a major issue, things like that. We have not made some magical jump with flea beetles. Um, and I, I've started doing a lot of research this last winter. Everyone, you pick one of those crops, you're like, well, you should, if you've been farming for, I've been farming almost 20 years, at some point I should know what the hell I'm doing with flea beetles, besides just like theoretically spray them or vacuum them up. There are population cycles that are just going to be there, you know, and there's things like that happened with leafhopper. Uh, there was a year where people were like, oh, there's no Colorado potato bugs. There's all those things that happen climactically, and obviously antenna play a role in whether you build that population up. Um, there's, there was research that came into flea beetles. I was looking at silica content of various things. So there's a bunch of things that, like, yeah, we can play around with, but we haven't solved the, the flea beetle solution at all. I should say, um, this last year we were using sticky traps and we found a new yellow sticky trap. I just happened to order yellow sticky traps and they came back and it was shinier than the last yellow sticky trap or has slightly different stickiness. It was super sticky. And we found those actually worked for the flea beetles. The problem was that we, at that point, had built up such a significant spring population of flea beetles that sticky traps at every like four feet in a bok choy bed were not really enough to capture all the flea beetles. Um, and I gotta tell you, like our crops in the springtime, we use a lot of soft rock phosphate. We like that phosphorus source. There was a, when Lancaster Ag shut down, my supplier was like, yeah, we can get you soft rock, but it showed up. It didn't show up in the springtime, so, and I didn't do enough to adjust, in my opinion, my phosphorus in the spring to, to load that. So we had, like, our quality was good in certain crops. I mean, you saw that spinach crop, but it wasn't, like, across the board good this spring. The quality was not what I'd say is great, and definitely showed itself with susceptibility to, to pest and disease. Um, there's a fall spinach crop, so there's seaside again, transplanted a couple weeks before, so it's growing there. Uh, in the fall, it's probably a single cultivation because weeds are not so much of an issue. Um, that seaside was harvested uh, in October, so the growing cycle, six weeks to harvest for that variety in the fall slot, whereas um, we, with that planting, we planted four varieties of spinach. Carmel is the variety we really like in the fall for quick, nice, beautiful spinach. So that by Carmel was probably harvested two weeks before the seaside was. But the nice thing was we planted all that spinach on the same day and we got ourselves a three to four week harvest window. Yeah, we double crop spinach. Is, one of the nice things about spinach is obviously most people are not gonna just grow a spinach crop. It's really well suitable for, for double cropping. So this was where our spinach went this fall. Uh, this is one of our newest fields, just came into production for us last year. Um, and so it's really young from a fertility perspective. Like literally is a crummy, crummy, crummy field up until June of 2018 when we started to do some things to it. And so this spring we grew uh, not a marvelous crop of brassicas, but a really very marketable crop of brassicas. And then that became our plot spot. And I put this slide on here because um, when I first started our, our farm in Dartmouth, not where we are right now, I split the farm in half and I did ro uh, cover crop on one half of the farm and cash crops in the other as I was like developing our market. Um, but I think I did something a little differently than most people. I still treated our cover crops like they were gonna become cash crops. I gave them fertility programs, I gave them foliar sprays, because my thought was like cover crops can do pretty magical things. We're horrible at cover crops right now, we can talk about that later, but but I wanted to make sure they could do magical things by having what they needed to perform. Where I'm at right now sometimes is like our best like crop improver if we're coming into the really early succession of poorly mineralized soils is just double and triple cropping because it gives us a really good incentive to go in and like put another round of good into the soil. So that's what we were doing here. This was a spring crop of spinach and then this fall crop and now all of a sudden next spring, this place has had kind of a double fertility application. So it's kind of accelerated the process of getting towards quote unquote the promised land. Um, so that's that same, uh, let's see about that now. This is that spinach that's, that's going into where that lettuce was. I mean, the brassicas were. And we see use these blue cards in the field houses. This was a, crop, a picture taken a couple weeks ago from a greenhouse crop. So it works out well in that sense. There's Carmel there, that nice variety. Um, there's a shot of our field house. So we just started harvesting 
uh, did a lot of that last week in cilantro, and the spinach will start cutting next week for the CSA. I mean, there's so much genetic, it's weird because spinach is a short crop, it takes like 35 or 40, and there's just like a ridiculous amount of genetic variation. And when I was uh, walking these with Julie from Johnny's, she was like naming a bunch of varieties, oh, you should try this one or that one, you know, just like, just constantly plant different spinach varieties and you'll find one. Um, I, I, the Carmel is probably, I, I get a bias, right? If you have one really good experience with a variety, you're like, this variety is amazing. And like the best spinach I ever grew was a Carmel variety. It was like maybe eight or 10 years ago. And then it went away from Johnny's and then it came back and Johnny's at some point was like, all right, I'm buying more Carmel. That was like, and it is. We run side by side with that in space in the winter and it, it sizes up a little quicker. It's quick to mature. Um, flavor wise, it's a really good spinach. We're not gonna spend as much time on basil and shallots because they're not as exciting, but we're talking about basil and shallots. Uh, all right, uh, that's a field house thermometer. Um, we do a lot of kind of learning from our environments. And so one of the things I like to do is stick thermometers in our soil in the greenhouse in the springtime. So when we're putting tomatoes in the ground or cucumbers in the ground, we have an idea of what's happening. So this was pretty interesting. This was uh, right before or right after we planted squash and zucchini this year. This is an unheated greenhouse. And this was nice because we'd had a couple of warm days and the temperature was up close to 80 degrees. And here, this is plugged into the hill like five or six inches. And after a cloudy day, the soil temperature was still almost 70 degrees in that unheated greenhouse. Like, all right. Like, what we know from this is that if our cucumbers and zucchini go into the ground here, I don't think we can blame temperature from being like that limiting factor for production. Um, so this year, I don't know why we did this. Um, I think we did this because a couple years ago I tried seeing how early can I plant basil in the field and get a crop. And the answer is not that early. <laughs> um, we planted basil like the, like the third week of April into some like cold, miserable spring soils and put row cover over it and it just sucked. Like half of it died off. So like, guess what? We don't ever need to plant basil in April on our farm again. Um, but then I, I guess I was just curious. I was like, oh, well, everybody always talks about double cropping with tomatoes and things in your tunnel or doing under understory crops. We historically haven't done that because I feel like things grow so fast that it doesn't make a lot of sense. But I wanted to play around with it. So we planted some basil and tomatoes in our field house. They were transplanted April 9th. And our, ba our tomatoes in our field house are on two foot spacing uh, or 18 inch spacing. And basically what we did is we put little blocks of basil in between, just on those outside rows. I don't know if you guys can see that, but you got three rows, tomatoes are in the middle, and you got basil clustered there. Um, and it got row covered, and uh, yeah, it worked. Um, I kind of questioned, like, was it worth it? It ended up, like, taking a lot of airflow away from the tomatoes. It maybe made pruning tomatoes. You did some probably pruning tomatoes with Mitchell, like, maybe it was more of a pain in the butt. Um, what it did was it allowed us to cut basil for the farm stand, you know, basically late May. And the advantage to that is I want to sell people a lot of basil in July and August, so what we're basically doing is like prepping them to be like, oh, Bricks Bounty, that's where I go get my basil. They have basil in June from the fields. They got basil from a field house, just small quantities, and I'd put small bags out. It's not like I'm stuffing the bags full of basil. I'm just putting like the kind of thing you'd see at the grocery store with a clamshell of basil. Just a small little basil for them to make their, their whatever thing they're going to grow, not tomatoes at that time of year in, in May or June. Um, I think we might do this next year and just have a bed of basil. Um, we've, we've grown zucchini the last couple of years in the tunnels, and it's been kind of up and down. But we, we're trying to figure out what crop can we plant in our tunnel that we can harvest by July 1st so I can throw the late tomatoes in. We always do a late crop of tomatoes. This year we didn't ever do it. But, so we might just do a, a bed of basil all by its lonesome. And, uh, but we won't, you know, once we get that basil coming out of the field, we won't treat that special. We're just like, let it be, rip it up. So there is heaps of basil because of the, the dollar figures in it. Um, so downy mildew has been the biggest issue and we got a chance to trial those varieties. Uh, this year we planted some really late plantings. Uh, in August from a 7-Eleven greenhouse start, and those guys matured into September and October, and I'll talk a little bit about those varieties in a second. Um, so this is a shot of Prospera. That's one of the new varieties that is downy mildew resistant. 
So Ital we've grown, I'll get to questions in a second, we've grown Italian large leaf as our primary basil. It's like a big fat, you know, gives you a lot of salad basil, um, sandwich basil. And I haven't really grown a lot of pesto, the small Genovese types. Um, so we like something that fills the bag quick. Prospera, um, what we've gone to now is like the Italian large leaf is good for an early succession or two, but we got to shift towards these downy mildew resistant varieties for our mid and late season ones. Monica, you got that? I haven't, she doesn't know it yet, but I have this like secret idea to get Monica into compost tea next year. Uh, we don't do compost tea on the farm. I just don't have enough like time in the day to do all the good stuff. But occasionally I have a crew member that says, I want to get into this good stuff. And then we like, so some years we do compost tea because we got a crew member who's like psyched to do compost tea. Um, I think that's really good information because the organic growers don't have a lot of, I, so John was selling some of Jerry Brunetti's products back in the day, these essential oil products. And I was like, that are supposed to do good for downy mildews. And I was like, I don't want to spray anything on my basil. Like basil is such a fine, like aroma based experience that I, we don't foliar spray our basil typically, although we've now started playing around with using phosphites because we're not organic and we can use a um, phosphite uh, fertilizer. But the genetics of these basils for us were really good this year. Prospera was the best, gave us the best yields, um, held up. You'll see a picture of that in another succession. And so this is how we've grown basil for a long time for the CSA is like we grow it and we think of it as like you guys get a ton of basil. I get these big pesto bags for a couple times a year because Basil's not really hard to grow. Um, and for a short period of time when it's warm and humid and all that stuff, it grows like gangbusters. Um, so we don't typically change the prices of things, but I certainly mentally have been like, oh, basil, that's June 1st basil versus August 1st basil. There's a different value in my mindset to something because it's so easy to harvest heaps of basil in August. Foot spacing three rows. Um, I sometimes do six inch spacing for the earlier things, but once we get into full cycle basil production, you need, um, for any of those basils that have the potential to get big, there's no advantage to packing it in. It's more time transplanting. Um, the only advantage would be maybe if you're tipping basil really early in the game, you get like a higher volume of tips. And we're growing our basil into 98s or 128s, growing four seeds per cell, so they're plugged, they're not single plants. Um, and they're transplanted pretty young. I think I have a slide about that in a second. Yeah. Uh, no, we just harvest it with our knives. We don't use a, something to mow it in there, and then it just grows back. And inevitably, we overproduce basil because you're not sure exactly what the rhythms of life are. We're not irrigating. That's one thing about not irrigating is you go a little bit more with natural rhythms. Um, so like this basil, we harvested about 80% of this bed. This was like a 200-foot bed of basil or something like that, 180 feet of basil. And by the time... Uh, we kind of maybe weren't fast enough, so like it got a little bit seedy, but then the next basil succession was ready to roll, and we're just like, oh, let's walk away from that basil. Uh, so this is our next succession of basil, and um, again, almost a full bed of basil. Let's see if I can get the little thing. And sandwiched between our lettuces, and got the deer fence up for those guys. Um, so that basil transplanted 629. Tra uh, this is a harvest, uh, 801. We're harvesting that bed on the very top. You can't see it here. But what we found, we're just trialing Prospera Devotion and Obsession, is that Prospera is the fastest growing and the tallest, and Devotion is the mid-slot, and Obsession's the slowest. So kind of like the spinach conversation that we just had with Seaside and Reflect, or Seaside and Corvair, is here we can transplant an entire bed of basil all on the same day, and we have, we don't have the whole thing, like a whole bed of Prospera for me here would be too much because the Prospera would start to get seedy and bolt. This obsession was the slowest, slowest bolting of those, so it actually slotted in really nicely. Didn't have that intention, it just sort of worked out. Um, there's some Thai basil, we grow a few of those you know, fancier basils. Here's a shot of that same basil bed from the other direction, you can't really see it here, but um, that's Prospera. It's already been harvested, and you can see the bump in height that goes into devotion. Um, this Prospera, so, you know, we're harvesting this, uh, this was on August 13th. We're probably harvesting this sometime late July, and we probably got four to five cuts off of it. It was the best of the downy mildew resistance, and it final harvest was on the 22nd of September, and it just sort of like, by that point, it had just been worked. I think we probably had too many cuts off of it. it just the leaf quality wasn't there. We're going to do a workshop on lettuce, so this is the plug for Nofa Mass, right? It's a beautiful lettuce crop. Again, not irrigated. Uh, we had nice moisture this year. The lettuce was transplanted on, the, on July 7th, so this lettuce is just getting harvested. Starfighter here is the first variety to get cut. 
And um, that was probably one of our nicer lettuce crops that we grew this year. And you can see I had cucumbers next door to it, right? Those are the cukes. And we often try to run lettuce or spinach or something that's quick and easy close to the cucurbits, the melons, that kind of stuff. This wasn't timed perfectly. The lettuce needed to go in the ground a week earlier than it did because uh, by the time we were harvesting the magenta heads, which are the slowest of variety there, the cucumbers were starting to, to get into it. This, this kind of tells you a little bit about our farm. We use a pickup truck for harvesting. Uh, I've got four fields spaced out, but uh, we're direct marketing stuff, and the farm stand is on the farm. We're not wholesaling, so I can sell really big heads of lettuce, right? If you're wholesaling lettuce or you're trying to go to a farmer's market, you kind of don't necessarily want something that's like, this is like seven or eight heads of lettuce in one of those bushel and three-quarter crates. Like, it's not economically effective to transport such a... So that's one of our niches. Grocery store head lettuce sucks beyond belief. Like, I mean, it is like... What, and I think it, the last decade, it's gone even further down the hill because there's been such an increase of the loose leaf cut, right? There's just so many fewer people growing head lettuce uh, in the wholesale channels, and then the quality just has to come from further and further away. So this is one of our niches. Hey, we got beautiful head lettuces. We sell them for four bucks uh, a whack at the farm stand, and it feeds an army. Really quickly, shallots. Um, they offer a long marketing window. If you're, if you're new to a market, what I often would tell young growers is like, don't grow head lettuce and spinach that has a two-day or three-day or seven-day window when you need to cut it and sell it. Grow things like potatoes and beets and carrots and stuff where you can harvest it and just wait till your customers have the need for it and you can keep your price there. So shallots are nice because they have this long marketing window. Um, so you don't have to move them. And for us, it was like how to diversify our current offerings. Here's what we do for alliums. We have green garlic. I don't grow green garlic. I find it too labor intensive at the wrong time of year. Uh, we cut garlic scapes in June. We have scallions cutting in June. We have fresh garlic in July. Fresh onions typically sometime around early uh, July. And then dry onions in the fall. Shallots slot into that window. Um, I guess for me, it's been the education. We have folks that actually cook at our farm stand because people like shallots. So we're like, hey, might as well grow shallots. We had people would ask for them. And what we did historically was trial a small amount of shallots, give them to the CSA a couple times, have them out for the farm stand for a week or two at a time. And then over the years, we've now grown to, we do a full bed of shallots, so like a 200-foot bed of shallots. And we have shallots typically from like when we start harvesting them in late July right till we run out of shallots at some point in the fall. Um, nobody's going to come and buy heap. I mean, maybe some of the restaurants will, but they're not going to come and buy like bushels of shallots. They're just going to buy small quantities. So extending that marketing window, extending that harvest season, pretty valuable. Uh, and there's a picture. We're using row cover on those guys just to give them uh, a boost. And uh, we cultivate them. They're bare ground, so they get cultivated a bunch. Um, this is our shallots next to our onions uh, mid-June. Um, I didn't have a picture of shallots, so I threw a picture of tropia onions in there. We found over the years, like, you know, everything you can do to make those onions grow fast helps out in terms of yields, and shallots are in that same category. So we've gotten to the point where we typically harvest fresh, good-sized shallots by uh, late July. And I do have a picture of one random shallot in our CSA share. This was from August of this past year. But, you know, they're just, there's something kind of flavoring the mix. You're not going to make a ton of money on them, but you're going to satisfy some random person that none of your neighbors are growing shallots if you've got neighbors that are just growing corn and beans. No, no, none of those fancy ones. Just Camelot and Conservoir from Johnny's, things that give, like, yield. I always, when people don't want, like, I'll call them shishi vegetables, whether, I just tell them to, like, go find one of our neighbors. Um, I like to grow food that feeds people um, based on quantity. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, I remember one of the guys doing New York City tomatoes used to talk about, like, Oh, you know, if I grow a really good hybrid tomato, it can be as good as an heirloom. Now, a lot of people might argue that or not. But I think that's sort of a little bit of my philosophy is, like, we, we grow things that aren't, this happens to be one special melon variety. Well, you've got golden gopher if anybody wants a really tasty melon. But most of these are just, like, random hybrids that if you give them the opportunity, they taste pretty good. We're not charging enough. We, char we have a 21-week season, and our full price is 800 bucks. No, we have 20-week season. Maybe even 19 week. I think I just keep cutting weeks out as a way to raise the price. Um, 800 bucks for the full share. This is the challenge, right? If you want to give people melons, they come in at the same time as sweet corn. And so you have a value of your share. I mean, it's a ridiculous value share. Probably in August, you have a bunch of $60 shares, and the people have given you 40 bucks for them. Um, and 
I would not do this if CSA was my only model. I'd come up with a different way to get the full value of it. But because I only have 60 or 70 members, I basically do this because it's fun to give people like the joy of, there are people that want to eat food. We've, you know, people that aren't in our CSA are people that don't want to eat food because they have a lot of, it's too much food for them. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges with CSAs right now is if you want to keep it, if you, if you don't do a market style system, which I think is the best way to do it, just say you get eight items a week or 10 items a week, let, let, let people pick. But if you do a fixed system like we do, it's too much food for the value. But I can't charge enough. I mean, 1,200 bucks, I'd, I'd say, would be for a, a 20 week season, 60 bucks a week. I think that'd be a fair price. They wouldn't get their full value at certain times of the year, but they'd get their full value at other times. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not. Um, so we do our shallots in half pints. So at the farm stand, it's an honor system, so we don't weigh a lot of things. And I, I meant to like grab some shallots so we could like look at them in that sense. But we've gone to selling them in, uh, we take a couple of those, break them apart, and put them into a half pint. So I don't honestly know what a half pint of shallots weigh. I haven't done that. But we sell them for 350 a half pint. And it's basically two or three. Sometimes people are like, are these shallots? Because they're like, you know, they get to be pretty sizable. The Camelot variety has some really large genetics. It's not going to be like Elsa Craig big, but it's, it's big. Um, and with 350 for a half pint, it seems like basically I try to target it. You're seeing the handout. I'm going to pass out in a second. Try to target about $10 per bed foot for the, uh, the Allium families. I don't have that number written down. So if you've made it this long, we're going to uh, gladly answer any questions that people have. And I told people a lot of this information was in this like, material-dense handout. So you can take one of those um, with you. It's got a lot of the information that we covered on the um, basal side of the equation, some shallots and a few other things. Some of the spinach stuff isn't in there because I was working on that before I came to the conference. And I decided to focus more on spinach when I put my PowerPoint. But I put this PowerPoint up on the, the World Wide Web, and the BFA will have this recording. So I think that's pretty much the end of the conversation from my perspective. So we're at questions. So you know, I said how, uh, how I, I don't think you want to track everything. One of the ways I track it might just be like having a piece of cardboard in the truck that I'm like, oh, I want to write that information on. This happens to be the basil harvest information that I wrote that day. The cardboard thing has a chance for me to look at that before I recycle it at the end of the season. But historically, I have a, a harvest clipboard that has what we're harvesting for the day or the week or whatever. Uh, and then on that harvest clipboard, I put like a yellow sheet of paper if I have something I actually want to track throughout the course of the season. And it's a heavier grade piece of uh, paper. I, I don't use, I'm like not technologically illiterate, but I choose not to use a lot of technology in my life during the growing season. I don't use a cell phone. So anybody who, like I don't have a cell phone, so I don't have any like quick way to record data. But then a lot of people are doing that. I just use paper. And then I have a different piece of paper. So like two years ago, I wanted to track squash and zucchini harvests. And I know that the, on that clipboard is that yellow sheet. And I can just go record that. And that yellow sheet just gives me a flag. And at the end of the year, I can be like, oh, what was on the yellow sheet that was important? OK, that was my, my data for this. But I don't try to track all of our crops data. That's why I try to take a snapshot of something, or I try to start in there with a question. Um, over the years, we have target yields for almost all of our crops. We have target time it takes to transplant or to harvest or to post-harvest all those crops. And I do some of those checks. Like, how long should it take to harvest a basket of arugula and bag of basket of arugula? And then how, what should our expectations be for our crew? Because one of the, I think, the biggest difficulties on a small diversified farm is you're trying to teach somebody how to do a zillion different things. And it takes, like, it takes a while. And so what we've done kind of differently, I used to have apprentices. Now we have people that hopefully they can learn a lot with us, um, but they're not technically apprentices. Um, we've shifted more so that we're doing a lot of like, um, we're harvesting seven days a week. We're never harvesting 300 bunches of kale. So it's really hard to get good at things. So we basically get crop specific. Like this person's going to become in charge of harvesting head lettuce. I think Monica harvested head lettuce twice this year, right? Something like that. So Danny was our head lettuce harvester. So just Danny and I harvesting head lettuce, nobody else. Because if you know head lettuce, you can really get to know how quickly certain things are growing, which crop in four varieties is the one that you need to cut. And you have all that knowledge as soon as you walk into the field. And for me to harvest a basket of head lettuce, 12 heads of lettuce, 14 heads of lettuce, it's going to take about a minute to like a minute and a half to do the actual cutting and getting the bin. And then walking to and from the truck adds 30 seconds to a minute. But I know, because I harvested that head lettuce last week, the day before, so on and so forth, I know before I even walk into that field what heads I'm cutting. 
And if I have somebody new come into that field, they don't know any of that information. So what we've done a lot, it might be more boring, I guess, to some degree for the growers. Hopefully it just gives them more confidence because they get skill as we really specifically train people on specific crops in the harvest season. And over time, like Monica might be our head lettuce guru next year, um, but you were on lettuce mix this, this year. Uh, all right, well, there's the honest thing. I don't think I actually trialed them side by side flavor-wise, so I don't have any way to answer that question. Um, we don't grow for chefs. We have one fancy restaurant in town that shops with us on a regular basis, but we don't, um, we just have an honest system farm stand. They show up with their car and buy random things. I think you could probably pull that apart. I think my palate is such that, um, I think I have a really generous range of what I find acceptable. And I think with me, with basils, like in the summertime, I'm basically doing tomato basil sandwiches um, and pesto. And we, I mean, I don't think we cooked anything with basil for like two months. My wife cooks, she has kids. We have kids, she takes care of the kids. Sometimes she goes fun places and I'm a farmer bachelor for two weeks and my meals are really simple. So Eleonora might be the best basil. Generally, people say our food tastes good. I think if anybody, like, there's a couple things. I have a work share member who's been with me for 10 years. And sometimes, I, like, I had a crew member once that then he went and worked in wineries. Sometimes you find people that are just tuned in. And so I will try to be blatantly asking. And I, I know certain CSA members of mine that are more, like, they really can ascertain quality. And so I often will ask them very, like, that person specifically. Like, that's the person I have to ask. Like, that person knows Swiss chard. They love Swiss chard. I'm going to ask them how this Swiss chard was. But a lot of times we're just tasting things in the field. And the herbs, I guess I do less tasting of things. Like, I do a small amount, but it's not like you're having huge mouthfuls of basil. Two or three full-time people plus myself in the summer, and then two or three part-time people in the peak of the summer. We're doing about six or seven acres. It's never enough people, but it's, we're trying to f that. And I, I don't have balance in my life. I'll be really blatantly clear about that. I work like 90 hour weeks, 90 to 100 hour weeks in the peak of the season. Um, but then I also take time off in the winter and my wife does raise our kids and I raise the farm vegetables and that's our sole source of income. So as you, anybody who has a mortgage or you know, financial obligations, those are pretty strong incentives to be like, oh, I'm gonna go work some more. Cause it's like, oh, I get to pay for a vacation by like, you know, harvesting tomatoes in the summer, basket of cherry tomatoes for us. We picked cherry tomatoes into two gallon bu back, uh, buckets. 15 minutes for the crew, maybe. 10 minutes, if you're really dialed in, you can fill a basket in six or seven minutes. Um, and you know, that translates into about 50 or 60 bucks worth of cherry tomatoes. So it's like, it's easy for me in the summer to be like, oh, I can go back to work for 25, 30 minutes and pick like a couple hundred dollars worth of tomatoes. Um, so it's a little bit hard, the balance aspect of things. We have three kids, they're four, seven, and nine. And I just get to do a little bit less with them in the summertime, or a lot less. We used to, I, I mean, I farmed in New York at Hawthorne Valley when I was there, and we used to use all 20-foot wide pieces and things. If you have multiple people that you're working with and in not super windy environments, I think wide pieces make a lot of sense. Um, I, we sometimes use some double row pieces, but we need to prep our beds accordingly. I typically use single rows because um, it is... Anybody can do it by themselves. And a lot of the workflow of us on our small farm, in the springtime, it's three of us. And so it's just, I gotta be able to do row cover at eight o'clock at night, and I don't wanna have to do it. And then from a risk perspective, if it's not fenced from the deer, you know, if you have one cover that rips, it just, yeah, economically. It, oh, we just use Progressive Grower. They, Nolts, they worked with Nolts um, down in um, Pennsylvania, but Progressive Grower has prices just like anybody else. And, the row cover, I mean, there's a cost involved in maintenance and that kind of stuff, but I wouldn't probably, like, if I was where you are, I probably would use half the row cover that, that we use. I think our coastal location really kind of incentivizes us. So then I might use none of the row cover, <laughs> and I might use any row cover. I mean, we get coastal winds, so, like, yeah, but, yeah, because we're not refrigerating lettuce. Um, and there is some time windows, like last summer, not this, this 2019, but 2018, we had, like, eight weeks where it never went below 70 degrees at night, so you're constantly harvesting warm lettuce. Um, but there are nicer situations. But yeah, for head lettuce, uh, our rhythms are, typically it's one of the first things we cut in the morning. Um, and we're harvested, we actually bring burlap, wet burlap on the back of the truck. And I'm so like anal on a hot day about keeping the heat off that crop as long as possible that we're like harvest and put baskets in the shade of the truck until we're ready to load everything up on the truck. So even just that like 15 minutes or 10 minutes or that kind of stuff, in the height of summer, we might be harvesting like six or seven, uh, maybe eight bins of lettuce on a day. 
So we'll just have one or two people cutting those heads, get them in the shade of the truck, and then our wash station's in the shade. It's never in the sun again. I'm pretty, like, like move things that, you know, if the wash station shade, sun and shade have moved, I'm like, got to move that out of the sun. Um, and then, yeah, we, uh, all of our head lettuce gets washed, goes through uh, just a Rubbermaid wash tank, kind of standard for, like, small farms. We scrub the stem end to kind of scar that so it doesn't milk as much. The head lettuce we wash, yeah. Oh, the loose leaf greens, yeah, unless it's a really massive rainstorm. But no, we're, we're like dipped Swiss chard. Herbs we might or might not, bunched herbs like parsley, that all depends on how wet things are. Yeah, but anything that you would traditionally need to dry, we don't wash because that aspect of like labor of drying. I mean, we, we do, we're wash lettuce mix. This, this fall we had a lot of rain, so we're washing a lot of lettuce mix. But like as a general rule, we don't wash it because it's more labor intensive. Head lettuce is just zip through burlap and you're good to roll. It's, uh, it's just over the bags, but it's not heavy burlap because basil can't handle that weight. It's just a lighter, you know, just make sure it's not soap, so soaking wet. So I want to be mindful because I think they're going to have another workshop in here. We can continue the conversation. If people have questions, we can kind of gather on the, on the back as we need to. But I will be around if people have questions. The presentation will be up online. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the day. Sure.